where the conflict was going on. Never uh, say they come from or whatever aspect of the conflict they come from. There was that um, obvious blockage that you do not talk to each other. Republicans don't talk to loyalists. If you do, you're a traitor, face and first, sir. But just like a repeat of history, I mean, people do talk to people. Particularly in situations, and one of the situations obviously was in the prison where people were locked up 24 hours a day. There have been meetings that occurred in prison amongst loyalist inmates and Republican inmates. Um, there were contacts there um, to establish various issues and various grounds, rules, and ground rules that they could work by. They were the same prison, maybe 10 yards away from each other, 24 hours a day, so you, you do get to uh, talk to people. And obviously, and when we were doing classes in education, etc., some of those classes were integrated because of lack of teachers. And we got to talk to Republican prisoners and also got to express different um, opinions on, on the conflict, which never before was actually talked about on the outside. That type of talking, breaking down of, of uh, those symbolic uh, buyers, I mean, spread to the outside because on the outside you had a war going on, a conflict going on and people want to know what people's bottom line was and on certain issues throughout the time and throughout the conflict over the, the whole conflict Republicans and Loyalists and Unionist politicians did speak to each other Maybe they spoke in secrecy or whatever, but there was always that. Maybe they, some of them didn't speak directly, but there was always a lane kept open. The role of paramilitaries in the future of Northern Ireland is going to be critical. And there's a lot of angles and very valid opinions that are being talked about in what to do. If you went to jail and you educated yourself and you thought through, or you joined the UVF or the UDA or the IRA for idealistic reasons, you believed in the cause, and now when the conflict is over and you really still, I assume, care for your community because you were willing to die for it, and you want to work with youth and improve your community, I think you should be given the benefit of the doubt. Interaction was set up uh, around about 1988 by two former uh, political prisoners. Um, on one side you had Billy Hutchison, who's a, an ex-UVF life sentence prisoner, and on the other side you had uh, Pat McGeown, former hunger striker. Both came out and got involved in community work and then went on to be elected Belfast City Councillors. And they uh, recognised that because of the conflict and the interface and the, the peace lane or peace wall that had been erected, uh, young people were growing up in the Shankill and the Falls and Springfield uh, communities without any contact and they believed that those um, barriers to contact needed to be overcome if we were ever to move out of the conflict. The trust was built in this room where um, an example that I had given one time before was that Noel Large for example who, who's a community worker from the, the loyalist side of the wall, um, had come down to do a piece on Fail FM radio in relation to interaction. And he was admiring the building before he had left, and uh, I'd said, sure, why don't you come down tomorrow, and I'll give you a wee tour around the place. And he said, yeah, I might just do that. So I'd forgot. I'd clean forgot about this tour um, the next day at 12. So the next meeting I was at, Noel had said to me, look, the reason I didn't turn off that tour was... My old jailhead had come back. And uh, I'd said, what do you mean? He says, well, I thought. He says, my old thinking was up the left, he says, and I didn't want to go down the next day. And I'm thinking to myself, well, here's a man saying to me that he thought maybe he was getting set up for something, and that's that trust issue that we speak of. But had that have been me, I'd have been saying, look, the reason I didn't weigh in for that tourist, like I just didn't feel well, or... But he told me the truth of why he didn't go there. You know, it spoke volumes, you know, so as opposed to saying, well, you know, the reason I wasn't there was because I thought maybe you were going to kill me. Something to that degree, you know, so that's the mindset that existed and that mindset 
I know I, I would hope it's expelled in relation to myself and, and the work that I would be involved in. The people who we sat around the table, this table with um, would have had no hesitation in taking my life. No hesitation. Um, so, I mean, when you're sitting around the table with someone who you know, they would have no one, they would have no hesitation in taking their life, and two, they were very capable of it, then you need to build a sort of trust with the people that you're sitting around the table with. So trust was a big issue. Um, if someone, say, for toxic rings me and says to me, there's an incident at this interface and here's what's happening, and the stone's coming across the wall uh, at a given location. So the first thing that I'm going to do is question, right, is this person genuine and bringing me to this location for this reason, or am I going there for another reason? So all them things kind of go through your head, because when you're... When you get a call on the phone and you go to a location in relation to innocent, you don't know what you're going to find until you get there. I was in this district about 10 or 12 years ago and I, I recently arrived back within the last sort of 18 months. And the one thing that would particularly strike me as someone who's been here, gone away and come back again, is now the amount of communication uh, in, in interface areas and the amount of contact between uh, communities in interface areas. And for me that's been the most enlightening and the most positive aspect of coming back into a district is the the willingness of people to um, move from you know historical positions and to engage with each other and to see that uh, in actual fact you know there is a commonality in in communities and interface areas and that to a degree some of the problems actually are the same on both sides of the fence so that by actually coming together and working together and again working with other partner agencies including the police that they can go a long way to to trying to resolve those and break down perceptions and break down barriers. Um, a lot of the times it was done out of the glare of the media which wasn't a bad thing um, because we were able to sort of work through issues um, without other people sort of having an input into what it was actually going or speculating on what was going on. We always see the, the worst side of ourselves saying, I mean, what do we get? We always get nothing. The other side always gets it. And that's one of the reasons why we, we try to encourage engagement and interaction and participation on a cross-community basis to allow people to experience, to knock the perceptions on the head. I think what our, our daily lives are all about today is perceptions of each other. We always perceive the other ones to be better off than us. We always perceive that there's a that the other side's greener than than our side, and I think that's I mean it's all down to perceptions, and it's a reality check that we all need to more or less experience and understand that we're all in this together. We are experiencing the same difficulties, and the problem with it is we need to do something about it together, not as individuals, not as separate groupings, but together. The amount of contact between the communities who are on interfaces has been the most heartening and the most um, encouraging aspect from, from my placing perspective. I think it has been tremendous that the steps have been taken over, over the last 10 years and there's a, a completely different understanding between the communities now. There are reports, for example, that have come via the police uh, where the police, not wanting to sort of escalate the situation along the interface, have got a report that... A, B and C is happening on the interface. They in turn have contacted Interaction through Roshan who in turn would contact the relevant community people and they would go and they would look at it before they'd bring the police into it. So in many ways it saved the resources of the police in coming in. On the ground maybe um, in the local communities I would say quite often people recognise the role they play. Uh, but the higher up you go... Um, if I, if I take the DUP, for example, the DUP don't want people like me or EPIC, the Ex-Prisoner Interpretive Centre, to have a positive role. One of the uh, initiatives that, that was started in another area was a mobile phone network, which we've seen um, happening in North Belfast. So we thought it was a good idea to try and start one um, in this area. So... We, community activists from both sides met and discussed the, the idea and, and actually started a mobile phone network. So it's up and running about four or five years now. Um, basically what the mobile phone network does, if there's any uh, incidents of, of violence along the interface, that uh, community workers on each side can contact each other and try and resolve 
whatever's happening. So that, that's worked quite well in this area, and we have seen a, a dramatic reduction in, in violent incidents along the interface. The mobile phone network is not about mobile phones. It's about building relationships between people. I'm Alex Prisoner, and it was a natural conclusion that I would become involved somewhere in uh, the mobile phone network. We were uh, deployed right along the whole interface um, because there was sporadic violence right along it. Um, and we found ourselves very quickly sort of like firefighting right along the whole interface. And they, they were busy times. They were times where you'd have been just settling into the house. You'd have thought you were finished for the night. Your mobile phone sitting there, been quiet for a period of time. And just as your adrenaline stopping, running, the phone would ring again and up and away you'd go again. So uh, it was a lot of commitment involved and uh, you certainly had no social life whilst you were, whilst you were uh, working on the network, you know. But um, today we're seeing the benefits of that work that was put in in the early days. At, at the start it was about uh, contact, uh, communication, um, and it developed and it evolved as the, the peace process started to kick in, in in the early 90s. In the mid-90s it would have been, say, reacting to, to incidents. We, we became more uh, of a community development project in that we were looking at issues beyond that in terms of poverty, deprivation. Uh, again, contact and communication played a big part, but we were looking at issues of common concern rather than just reacting to a violent incident. Although we started off as an interface organisation working purely on the interfaces here in West Belfast, over the years that has developed and we now would be a conflict transformation organisation. As I say to people, we just facilitate difficult conversations. Um, that can be between individuals, sometimes it's between organisations, and sometimes it's between groups that would have been former enemies, and sometimes between st the state and, and communities, and that's basically what we do over a, a, a broad range of issues. Well, the Innerish Forum are involved in all sorts of uh, things within East Belfast. They're involved in the, uh, all of the schemes that are coming into East Belfast. They would they would have they would have a, 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 a mantle in actually working them out and where they're going to and who they're going to. Uh, the, a lot of the things that the important things that I think that are involved in is, is that they we have a, a, a once every two, uh, uh, two or three months we would meet with the, the MLAs. Uh, of the area and, and and the local MP, who you you you, you call the account for stuff that's happening that you, you feel or stuff that's not happening, and also the police. You know we we have the police who sit on 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 the the inner east forum, and the the thing about that is is that when the when there was interface violence and stuff happening, we were able to con actually confront the PSNI there and ask them why things weren't happening or why things should be, and also parades as a, as a, as an issue in in our areas and the, the policing of the parades and, and the routes that the parades take. And all that stuff there is, goes through the Inner East Forum. Uh, the, the, three, uh, the three, as I told you, three loyalist paramilitary groups sat on it, but also the three uh, loyal orders sat on it, the Black Persepitary, the Orange and, and the Apprentice Boys also sat on it, who also have given uh, within that group uh, a, a bit of a remit to actually sit down with nationalists and to ensure that p parades go peacefully on both sides and that you know all, all the stuff that's needed takes place before parades happen. Where you have had the most violence in a city, if you can build relationships with people in, o in order for them to have a mutual peace and I don't mean peace by the big P, I mean just be able to close their door at night, maybe to take grills down from their windows, maybe to feel their kids are safe playing on the street. If you can build relationships where they're most fractured, surely that has an impact across economically across any city. Christy was formed in uh, 1998 and uh, it's uh, an organisation that's there to help Repub ex-Republican prisoners in the main. Um, they have a number of projects uh, designed to, to aid that process. Um, the Legacy Programme, PNB, Process of Nation Building, um, Irish Political Tours, which I'm involved in directly myself. Well, EPIC was originally set up um, 
way back in 1980s, but in about 86. And in 1986, basically, we were looking at prisoners coming out of prison. You had spent a long time in prison, and when they came out of prison, there was no support mechanisms. So we developed our, started to develop our own means of, of uh, assisting each other. Th those were the first period in the conflict where direct com combatants were actually talking to each other about the practical issues of actually coming out of prison, getting jobs, getting a home, getting a house, getting all of, all of the practical things, also looking at the ways being an ex-prisoner hindered you in your way outside, whether it be through employment or through your future. The political tours grew out of what we have noticed here in Ireland. Quite a few people come in and, and tell the stories and they come and do a piece of work on it and sometimes don't portray it the way we would see it. And I think it was important for Republicans to get their message across. Uh, the political tours was a, an opportunity to do that. And I think the first tours went ahead about four years ago. Um, they were carried out by a number of local ex-Republican prisoners. And it gives ex-combatants the opportunity to tell the story um, from their perspective. It also gives ex-Republican prisoners a chance to come into employment. It gives them uh, an opportunity to do something um, post-conflict. And the initial impact of the, the um, ceasefires was that people stood back and said, well, well, it last. And then when it did last, you, you started to get tourism, tourists come. Now, originally, what we got was students and universities coming across to study the peace process. And obviously they wanted to talk to both sides. So initially we got involved with the academic side of it and saying, well, lawyers have to get their opinion across too. And we would uh, facilitate it across uh, community lectures, seminars with different universities, etc., and people studying peace studies. Then we found that, you know, all of a sudden, with the peace in Baden, that Belfast was coming attractive, becoming attractive to tourists. Then we found that all of a sudden we had these huge number of tourists coming to Belfast. The IRA was in this school and they fired shots back at the mob and they killed one and shot and wounded a number of others. Primarily, the design is to put a message across, a political message, about what happened in Ireland over the past 30 years and beyond that. But we do speak specifically about what's happened over the past 30 years, but there's obviously our history goes right back 800 years in terms of British Irish conflict. There is an opportunity of growth there in the future for them, where they could, could become a very viable enterprise, which would um, give opportunities to extra public and prisoners and their families and other people within the Republican community to work in a broader field f for toxic B&Bs, hostels, or providing food, stuff like that, their transport. So there is the opportunity there, but it's not the primary. It's more about getting the message across. We did feel that um, it was wrong, and we still feel it's wrong, that um, the capitalists will tend to uh, come in to make their money. Um, they bring the tourists in, they flight around these areas in their tour buses, and then they're away, and they don't spend any money in the local community. They don't spend money in the local pubs, clubs, restaurants, and things like that there. And l looking at it from a purely um, uh, selfish reason, I feel like we felt that our communities burn the front or burn burn the brunt of the the conflict should also in some way um get something from whatever comes out of that conflict, so we have been doing joint tours because we do we do accept that most tourists that come here want to hear both sides of the stories, and uh they do come with pretty much open minds. So uh, as part of our, our initiative, we said, well, you know, what's good for both our communities? It's good for the people in Nationalist uh, West Belfast, and it's good for the people in Nationalist Belfast, West Belfast, where if we can tap into this tourist industry, get people to um, use uh, the pubs and clubs in the area, the shops in the area, and restaurants, and you know, then our people's going to benefit from this tourist trade. So that is it, probably the main thrust of it. Um, where we're not seeing it as a Republican and Loyalist, what we're saying is, well, you tell your story and we'll tell ours. Quite a few visitors that we get would be coming from England, and they most certainly have their own perceptions in terms of the stuff that they would have got through their own press and what they would have seen. 
and that would be pretty much a pro-British line. And while that's fine, I think it's also equally important that we get the opportunity to tell those people how we see it from a, a Republican's perspective. We tell our tourists that that's where we're coming from and we make no apology for that. Uh, so it gives us the opportunity, it then gives those people an opportunity to go away and assess what they've heard and make up their own minds. Um, I think that's important. Ardouche, uh, what's your bell for us, yeah? It's uh, Mr. Podic McCarter, August is here, can we may? The political tours themselves um, start each morning at 11am and the tour starts at Divis Towers. People can purchase tickets from the Welcome Centre in Belfast or the Coulter Lawn on the Falls Road. We generally meet people there and we would brief them first of all on health and safety issues and we would give them a brief outline of Harry's history. We don't profess to be historians but we do cover from the British occupation of this country some 800 years ago and we bring them up to specifically 1916. We cover that period till the 1921 and the setting up of the Northern State. We would then give them quite an in-depth rundown on what happened from 1969 onwards. There would be a brief intro as what actually happened in the statelet over the 50 years of its existence. Give them, trying to put it in context that people can actually follow it. We tell them about the Divis Towers, about how people were killed there. A young boy, Patrick Rooney, Trooper McCabe, people like that there. We then take them on the journey up the Falls Road, St Comgall School, on up to the International Wall, where all the murals are. We cover like Conway Street, the Gardens of Remembrance, where, where ARA volunteers, civilians are remembered. We have Conway Street, the, the mills, the, the flax industry, the linen industry. We cover the library, the Carnegie Library there, the Sinn Féin Centre, the Bobby Sands mural, uh, a brief history about the Royal Victoria Hospital, and then up into the Coulter Land where people can get an opportunity to take a break and get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, purchase their tickets if they haven't already done that. And the, the tour continues on up the Falls Road, up around Beachmount where the H Block Memorials are. Um, we, we point out the Coist the office as usual beside the Robert Bully. Uh, mural just in Beachmount Avenue um, and we finish the tour in round the Republican Platinum Milltown Cemetery where we talk about the people who, not in, not in any specific sense but just generally about the people who have died as a result of struggle, people, IRA volunteers, male and female who have died in active service and we show them the proclamation that was read out, we had alluded to earlier on in the tour in 1916. Tourists flock into uh, interfaces to see the uh, peace walls, uh, to see graffiti, to see um, murals and so forth. I, I don't find that terribly exciting or terribly inspiring, I have to say. I think there's something guilish uh, about that. Um, but I do understand that there is a certain element of political fascination as far as uh, those tourists are concerned. And I suppose it is natural given uh, the, the world that we live in today, which is televisual and which um, sees these images uh, in far-flung places. And people are naturally curious to see what is going on and to witness the aftermath. But I do think that there is something uh, rather purient uh, about uh, tourists coming along to see these things. And uh, I'd much prefer not to have that tourist industry uh, rather than to have it. Uh, I'd much prefer not to see the walls. I'd much prefer that the divisions that exist in our community are eliminated. I think the greatest difficulty is the, the ability to, to meet and interact with each other because of their, our peace walls. Uh, the divisions between the two communities is a major, major obstacle and uh, it doesn't allow for any sort of contact at all. Only on times when there is trouble that community leaders will try to engage with each other. Peace walls are part and parcel of our society. They're part of our history. Um, they've been going up for years and continue to go up. Now, we had one just put up last year. Um, that's a, a sad indictment of where we want to head and people need to ask themselves seriously what, what type of society they want to live in. Yes, I think Peace Walls are uh, a tourist attraction and it's, uh, it'll continue to be for quite some time. It's nearly like the Berlin Wall was a tourist attraction until the Berlin Wall came down. When the Berlin Wall came down, people now go and visit the space where the Berlin Wall used to be and I think it'll be the same 
for a long time to come. When we get the peace walls down, people will continue to go and visit and say, there used to be a peace wall along here, but look at it now, isn't it great? It's a big thing that we're dealing with, uh, is the past. Uh, I was recently at a discussion there, people were talking about taking the, the, the peace walls down, and I, I, I think that's that's going to be a long process, that the people need to the, the, the address the past, because that's what, why the walls are up, That uh, because of what's happened here. It's about building trust, it's about working with each other, and it's also about stability. I think we need political stability here, uh, and that has to be working together. And dealing with the past and the legacy of the past is a big element of that. I'm in politics, uh, and my, the sole reason that I'm in politics is to bring about peace and reconciliation. Now we've established a form of peace, We've a, we have done away with paramilitary and sectarian violence on an organised scale. But we still have to bring about reconciliation between the two great traditions here, the nationalist tradition and the unionist tradition. And that is my objective as a politician. That is the objective of the SDLP. That's why we're in business, to bring about reconciliation. And in that way, uh, we are addressing the uh, underlying problems that have given rise to the existence of the interfaces, the peace walls and, unfortunately, the violence that we've experienced over uh, uh, three decades. First of all, we have to investigate the actual conflict and be honest about it. And what we see today is the sanitization of the conflict by the middle classes and upper classes. And that, they will blame the paramilitaries. They will blame the ex-prisoner population. They will blame all the extremists and all this here. And they'll say, look, you know, Northern Ireland would be a lovely wee country if, you know, all these bad boys would go away. You only have the Scotch service of Northern Ireland and you'll find sectarianism. You'll find sectarianism in the Malone Road. You'll find it in the Star Mellis Road. You'll find it in the golf clubs, and you'll find it everywhere in society. Um, permeates with the Northern Ireland. It wasn't me or my community that they say that, that they would have segregated education, or that they would have segregated libraries, separate teacher colleges. Um, so sectarianism is spread throughout Oh, society, Northern Ireland. People need to sit and think about, you know, well, did I, was I responsible for part day even? But what we get is a complete denial. Mm -hmm. You get a complete denial from the middle classes and upper classes that they had anything to do with the conflict. It wasn't our fault, it was those bad boys up the Shango, those bad boys up the Falls Road. You know, when that, that is not the truth. Our society was chronically sick for a number of reasons, and the people who made it sick was everybody who wasn't lived in it. Whether you turned your head, whether you accepted the status quo as what it is or whatever, the society was chronically ill. And until the whole of society accepts it, when I'm at, you know, it wasn't just those, it wasn't just those people, it wasn't just those people. Everybody had a, a, a part to play in the society then. Everybody has a part to play in rebuilding it. There's probably negatives and obviously positives. Um, I see a great sense of uh, community bonding. It's come out of the troubles. Um, uh, a, a sense of pride um, from within the nationalist uh, community. Uh, the peace process at the moment, um, giving people a chance to uh, further uh, their aims in terms of the Republican agenda. Um, the, the downside is there's still so many uh, questions uh, unanswered uh, for, for families who have had people killed. Um, they're the things that sort of come to my mind straight away. People think, you know, the war's over, we'll go away and everything's going to be rosy. Periodically, throughout Irish history, we're not being in every generation or every decade in the past century. I mean, there was conflict. It rose its head, it kept raising its head and kept raising its head. 
whether it be in the 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s, it always kept raising its head because people thought, right, the war's over, walk away and everything will go back. We can't do it this time. What we need to do this time is ensure that it won't come back again. And the only way to ensure that is to continue the programmes that people are doing, to continue teaching people and look at the things that we do to see if we can make it better for the future. I think looking at our current programme of tours, it's essential that we engage with young people uh, right across the board. There's obviously a time when our tours are completely packed by foreign visitors and it's important that we meet that commitment. But I think what I'm looking at now is when the lull comes that we can start targeting local people, local young people, Irish schools, uh, community groups, because it's surprising the amount of people who do not know our history even though they have lived on that road for quite a while. So yes, crucially important, that would be one of the things I'd be looking at about developing the tours and bringing young people on board and letting them appreciate the suffering um, that happened within this community and right across the board, let me say, and that they should know about that and maybe try and get some sense of appreciation. Whether people like it or not, a lot of young people in the communities that I grew up in and work in, look up to ex-combatants or ex-prisoners. They see them as uh, role models, if you like. Now, I am conscious of that, and I take opportunities to speak to young people when and where I can. And it's not to say to them, get into them. It's to say, look, if we need to move on and if we want to move on, then we have to play with our heads and we have to get smarter and we have to get involved in community development because community development is the way forward for the community that I work in. If we are to really move forward uh, as a community and, and, and as a people, uh, if we don't have that respect, uh, if we don't recognise the diversity that all, all communities have, uh, if we don't understand uh, or try to understand the difference in ethnic origin and, and, and cultural background and history, then we never go we never go forward. We'll either remain static or go backwards. Uh, and I think uh, uh, as a community, we need to do that. We need to get an understanding of, for for example, we would need to, uh, as the saying goes, walk in that other person's shoes for a period of time to find out what it is that they believe is important from their background, from their history, from their identity and accept the diversity that is in communities and, and is something that we can move forward together. Part of the Good Friday Agreement said that uh, there had to be reintegration now, I'm not saying that I should be allowed to join the police. I'm not saying that I should have a, uh, an opportunity to become First Minister or anything else. Look who is in your government. Some pretty deadly people from the past. They have changed. It is almost unimaginable to anyone, the two top people now in your country, that they would be together. So if they can change, why are we constantly holding the money Instead of really funding the paramilitaries that are willing to seriously do make a change. In my opinion, ex-combatants have a very, very important role to play, if they're genuine. In a way, we're abandoning um, those paramilitary groups to the most violent and maybe criminal element. Uh, because we're not funding and keeping in the loop or in the mix those who did, who were combatants, but now want to make a difference. If we're not giving, keeping them involved in community, in the communities, we're only going to leave those who have no other alternatives and maybe are selling drugs or using violence. I know that I have played a positive role in reducing conflict and in improving the quality of life for people in the Shangle. If you go down to Kirk Street, and you look at the bungalows that were built there uh, around 2000 and you talk to those people, they will tell you that I have played a positive role in reducing conflict because then people are living in 
in bungalows or old age pensioners and people with special needs that had to put grills in their windows. And we have done our best to nullify that. Now, I can see too much of a Nigel Dodds or Diane Dodds down there when all hell was letting loose except when there was a camera. But that's the nature of the, the, the game. I'm not in it for plaudits. I'm in it to improve the quality of life and to make things peaceful so that young people in the unionist, loyalist community do not have to go down the road that I felt I had to go down. And if I can do that, then I'll have done a good job. I don't need pats in the back from the DUP or anybody else for that matter. And it's not just the DUP, but there are people within uh, the unionist community that don't want to see uh, people like me having a role to play. You get politicians saying it all the time, the paramilitaries are uh, torturing their areas and stuff like that there. In the areas that we live, the paramilitaries have helped to defuse situations and supported most of the peaceful efforts and, and helped to, to bring situations to where they are this present day. And if it hadn't been for them, to be quite honest with you, uh, the, a lot of these areas would have been still in turmoil.